Hey, Prof Hamilton. So chapter four, uh, the title, The Theory of Individual Behavior. Well, I think you'll find this chapter um, theoretical. <laughs> it, it's one of the more challenging ways that, I guess, economists try to think about behavior. And um, the, the chapter talks about this some, but it's this idea of utility, which basically is how do we turn what we want into a mathematical equation? Okay, so some things like we'll see in this chapter, a budget constraint actually it does make sense to or intuitively set up a budget constraint. Uh, but we also have to kind of use our economic imagination with this concept of utility. So, all right, let me go ahead and start the show. So learning objectives, I'll let you read through that on your own printout. Okay. So consumer behavior, it's really buyer, you know, potential buyer behavior, is we look at two things, uh, what is available under their budget, and secondly, how do their preferences prioritize within that budget what they want to buy. So here is some, um, again, more microeconomics than we really need to know to proceed, uh, but just some logical things uh, um, uh, that, um, well, you can just read through them here, you know. If, if A is preferred to B, and they would also, second point there, B could also be preferred to A, then the two must be equivalent, okay. Uh, property two, more is better. Anyway, you can read through this here. Uh, the, these are basically saying, in a nutshell, this is what you need to take this from this page. Consumers are rational, okay. And we know, well, in some sense we think people think about their buying decisions and other we can probably think of examples where people get caught up in a bidding war or buy something on a whim or have regrets even they should have known beforehand not to buy the sports car without asking their wife okay uh, I didn't do that but I've done other things so all right so constraints uh, the constraint is going to be in this case, the budget constraints. So there's other maybe time constraints or uh, legal constraints, but we're talking about budgets. Okay. So I said at my intro, it, it actually we'll just look at the budget line here. The idea is well, if if, if we have a total income of M, and as is common in micro, we only look at two goods. So we could look at X and Y, or we could say, well, that isn't there like a thousand or a million different. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly dozens in anyone's budget. Sometimes they'll look at one good X, and then Y is everything else with some kind of average price. So, but yeah, intuitively, yes. Yeah, so this is kind of like a revenue, uh, really spending category. So how much do we spend on X? Well, the price of X times the quantity of X. Similarly, how much do we spend on Y? Price of Y times the quantity of Y. And we could extend this to three or ten different items, just add more letters, Z and A, and so on and so forth. Okay. So the budget constraint, there's two extremes. If you spent, so what we're plotting here, the quantity of Y and the quantity of X. Okay. And if we spend our total income, M, on Y, then that would give us if we wrote it out, maybe I'll show it here. No, no, they didn't. Okay. Um, if we took price of Y times Y equals M, because there's no X, then we can actually solve for Y. Y is our total income to say, you know, $1,000. It's $100 per item for Y. We could, be, we could buy 10. Similarly, if we spent all our money on good X, uh, would be the total income divided by the price of X. 
So this is showing some bundles. We'll go back here. So bundle G would be within our budget, really not spending all of our budget. You can say, well, that's good, but really here there's not really a savings component. We're, that's already maybe taken out. This is saying, you know, we're going to spend on this line. Okay, bundle H would be unaffordable. So our budget set is the you know, triangle there to the southwest. Uh, the budget line, if we wrote it out, solving uh, for y from our original budget would be as given there. Okay. And the slope is of interest, basically the trade-off of as we move from all y to mostly y and a little bit of x to something in the middle to the other lower extreme where it's, it's all or almost all good x. So that is the trade-off between the two. And here we're going to look at an example. So essentially the slope of the line is sometimes called the market rate of substitution. So the, the differences in the how much y we have going from 4 to 3 and then going from 2 to 4, they happen to be similar numbers. Uh, uh, that gives us the rate of substitution. Okay, so we had to give up one y, this says, to gain two x's. So higher income, not surprisingly, expands the um, spending opportunities. Conversely, if income goes down, uh, that triangle is going to get smaller. If the price of X change, you say, well, that, that one doesn't change income, that's just the price. But indirectly, if something, if one of the goods you normally buy gets cheaper, in effect, you have more income. You could say the money that you didn't spend compared to the original price on good X uh, now is extra income. So, so again, it's kind of exaggerated here. Well, it depends on what the good X was and how much, how much the price dropped, but we would get a new budget line. Unlike the previous graph where it was a, a parallel shift out, now though it's a, a uh, pivoting. So, and this comes from, well, if, if we were buying all Y before no X, at that point wouldn't change because at that point we're not buying any, uh, any of the X value or X good. So here's some examples. The homework will take you through this as well. I will let you work through that in the notes and the homework. Uh, this is where we're going to bring in, well, what, what point do they choose then? All X, all Y, half and half? Well, you know, uh, it just depends, okay? It depends on what, uh, what goods we're talking about. Okay? So we have this marginal rate of substitution. Let's go ahead and do this here, okay? We've added this other curve here, and that turns out to be what they call an indifference curve, or you think of that as representing the combinations that give some level of happiness or well-being uh, from X and Y. So we could have uh, a lot of Y and a little bit of X, and we'd be pretty happy. We could kind of have in between at this point in the middle of the bow or down the bottom part a lot of X and a little Y. Okay, we would satisfy that too. It is, uh, and, and they do an example, I think, on the next couple slides, but it can be challenging because it's like, what, what are X and Y? Well, it could be how much you spend on um, electronics versus sporting goods. Okay, so it could be how much um, you spend on... Um, um, eating out versus um, going to the movies or something. And there would be some sense, well, you could have a very high level of one and a low level of other at some point. That would be the same level of satisfaction as some, some other combination. And, and that's, I said at the beginning, I'll say it again, that's where it gets a little bit challenging because people are like, well, I don't, I don't really think about indifference curves, but in some ways, yeah, we'd be willing to trade off. Uh, another example is, is not, well, it's kind of a consumer example, is uh, work 
versus leisure time. So are you willing to work more to gain more money, but then you'd have less time in the week? Well, we make those decisions not usually with an equation or a graph, but in our mind, um, how would we trade off those two, or what combinations would actually be kind of the same um, level of satisfaction? So B is a little bit higher, so it has at any point there's compared to the original line, there's a a better combination. Okay, C or the third point there where it intersects with C, that's going to be important because that is the highest level of utility or well-being, we can think of it as, that this consumer could afford. Okay. So that's our equilibrium. At D there, it just popped up. That's unattainable. We couldn't, we cannot get that level of, we can't buy, you know, a brand new $3,000 top-of-the-line TV and also have, um, buy, I don't know, a car, okay, <laughs> or send our kids to college, I don't know, <laughs> or send ourselves to college, okay. All right. Um, okay. So this goes through again, coming back to that kind of idea of, well, what if um, uh, just one of the prices changes? How is that going to impact what choice they choose? And uh, let's look at how this example plays out. Okay. So that's the initial level is at point A. Not too surprising, and that, that's always going to pace. It's going to be a straight almost always anyway, straight demand curve and then we're looking at the indifference curve that crosses the two. If the price of X falls, so now there's an expanded uh, opportunity or budget constraint or you know, budget opportunity constraint, whatever, uh, then uh, we certainly buy quite a bit more X according to the scale of this graph and now we would find a new indifference curve, uh, the one that intersects or is tangent to, I should say, the, the new budget constraint. So in this case, we've actually bought less of Y and um, certainly more than X. So we've gone from A to, we will call that B. Okay, yeah, there we go. So since with a, when the price of X fell and we bought less Y, then we can conclude that these two are substitutes. Okay. Uh, we had this in the previous chapter as well, but now we're kind of getting more at the theory of what's behind this. And it is a theory, I mean, it's it's a, a true theory if there is, well, hopefully there is such a thing, uh, in that, well, Roughly, this is how things work, or there are certainly budget constraints out there, and people try to pick the best combination within their budget constraint. And you can say, well, what about credit cards? Okay, well, that's still a lifetime constraint or um, uh, kind of a two period, you know, buy, buy now on the credit card and pay back later, um, and then be have even a smaller. Um, spending capacity in the future as you have to pay back with with interest okay so all right so here we're going to go again the uh, with a higher income uh, normally we would think that both goods you'd buy more of but they might show an example where we buy uh, more of just one and that would just be based on that kind of shape of the uh, indifference curve last item here so there's actually two things going on when, when one price drops. One is that because it's just cheaper, even not to the second point yet about income, that people are going to tend to buy or consume more of, say, good X at its cheaper price. Secondly, though, because you're spending le less per X, you're also going to have, a, in effect, a higher income or more spend or yeah, more spendable money compared to if the price was at original level so um, this graph brace yourself gets a little bit messy so 
this is, you know, you might do this in principles of microeconomics. It's more something kind of an intermediate economics uh, micro for, say, uh, an economics major. And uh, so this takes a lot of kind of mental or graphical gymnastics to kind of compare, well, uh, what is the substitution effect and what is the income effect? Okay. So, oops, go back there. Um, so I, I don't want to spend really more than I already have just showing this graph here uh, because it, it's not really, one, it assumes several things. Um, one is that there's only two goods we're considering. Uh, number two, that, and probably the biggest assumption, is that there's some well-defined um, trade-off or utility function in, in this consumer's mind, which... Uh, unless they're an economist, they probably, even I don't, <laughs> hopefully I don't have lines like that in my mind. So, but, um, so be familiar with the idea, well, yes, both these things are happening from a change in price. The graph, though, is, is a bit overkill. Okay. So the chapter goes through some applications, kind of some interesting ones of how it's buy one, get one free. is not the same thing as half price because you have to buy two in the end as it turns out. Um, so uh, uh, this example goes through, again, the, the graphs to me, I'm not a real visual guy. I, I like to work these out kind of mathematically or intuitively, but you can draw graphs like this. To me, it gets, you really have to um, spend quite a bit of time to um, understand why, what, what's happening here. So. Uh, so there's, uh, w w my, my point here is, if I have one, is that focus on the, the intuition, not necessarily, I mean, it's good to kind of take it step by step, and in our uh, online virtual session this week, uh, we could go through something like this in more detail, if so, request it. Okay. Okay. Another example here, kind of a classic example, how do you trade off? work which generates money versus leisure which is leisure right so a couple other things here you can actually use this to come up with well as the price changes uh, you're going to come up with um, different amounts of X you're going to buy. So you can do that, at least conceptually. This is kind of how the economists think of how people come up with a demand curve is really going back to their budget constraint and their preferences. So we could get a demand curve and we could find a third point and so on and so forth. I think this is the last slide. If, um, once we have the individual demand curve, so everyone would have a different budget constraint, at least slightly, if not a lot different preferences in terms of how we want to allocate our budgets. Uh, then you can add those together. So at any price, you add horizontally. Okay. So A and B um, at a price of 40. Uh, person A would have bought 10, person B would have bought 20, so you just combine those. And of course you would do that potentially for a lot of people. So, Okay, so that is uh, chapter four. Uh, to be honest, probably my least favorite chapter. I try to not let that on too much, but it's, 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 it's some things we will see throughout the book and um, but I think it's really challenging for students to kind of go from this, uh, this concept of utility. And I think the biggest thing is just to be, um, go with it. You know, that, all right, there's some known trade-offs. In practice, we don't have that level of detail even in our own minds. Never mind how we read other people's minds to find out how they're going to react. But um, some of that we'll come back to later in the course is that you just try it. You change the price say and how people what happens to quantity is tied back into these these concepts all right chapter four in the books